So probably one of the biggest things that I've heard or, or the most common criticisms, and maybe you'll have a chance to respond yeah. to it here, would be that it's distributed by VidAngel Studios, which is run uh, it's by... It's Angel Studios now. Oh, Angels, the, the, the Angel me. Studios, yeah. Angel Studios, run by Mormons, if yep. I'm not mistaken. And, of course, Mormon theology on Jesus is different from Christian theology in a significant way, yeah. um, or at least official Mormon theology. What would you say to those who are concerned that perhaps Mormon theology on Christ might creep into the show? So this is an interesting question. This is something that Dallas has been... Uh, you know, answering, you know, from day one and, and he knew it going in, but there's a difference between uh, Angel Studios and The Chosen. Okay. Uh, Angel Studios, they, they distribute it just like UPS distributes packages. Mm -hmm. But to, to just be blunt, the, the uh, difference of theology didn't happen until after Jesus left. Like we, I think we all agree upon the stories of Jesus and his parables and where he's at. It's when it's left, that's where theology kicks in, you know. And one thing that I do love about Dallas, and I, and I, I, I was very curious on this when we first started. There was a scene where the shepherd saw an angel, but you couldn't see the angel. You saw this light, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why didn't you show an angel? He goes, I don't know what an angel looks like. And then two, that would take people out of it. Now, in the show, uh, The Chosen, wouldn't you think that we'd actually show the, the baptism of Jesus Christ? Why wouldn't we show that? And once again... Uh, the reason why is, here's the thing, is there's so many people that believe that the baptism was done in a certain way, right? And there's like theology on it. Yeah. Well, we avoided that. Why would the Chosen's writers avoid theology on subjects that could divide? Because the ecumenical fan base unites Roman Catholics, professing evangelicals, and Mormons under the banner of the authentic Jesus of the Chosen. What's been so beautiful about seeing the show grow like it has, is you've got Catholics and Jews and Mormons, or again, I'm sorry if I use the wrong term, and evangelicals, we're all loving the same show. And this show is about Jesus, and it's an accurate portrayal of Jesus, I believe. So maybe, just maybe, we love the same Jesus. I know that may be controversial, but it, I think yeah. it's true. And what else matters, you know? Yeah, I mean, th yeah, there are things that, I mean. There, there are uh, things that matter, but. There are things that matter for sure that I, I think you and I probably are both currently getting a lot of love and probably getting some people going, whoa, 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 careful. Uh, Daryl, uh, from the beginning, been a partner on this project, so he and I are joined at the hip from now until Jesus comes. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. I think there's a lot of intrigue to understand the relationship that is emerging, I think, um, in the larger Christian tradition, but uh, particularly among, which is relevant to our audience here in Utah, or a lot of our friends in Utah, is the relationship between the chosen and the Latter-day Saint community and the evangelical community, or sometimes referred to as traditional Christians. Right. Well, I'll start out since I you know, started it from the beginning. <laughs> yes, right, right. <laughs> now, I do think it's important to point out that that both Brad and Daryl are LDS. Yes. And so that's oh, sure, why sure. this is unique to have this conversation and for them to be involved in something that, that maybe started out as an evangelical thing, but as God has worked through it, it has become everyone who wants to have a relationship with Christ is, is really yep. experiencing a wonderful thing. This is Greg and Jill Johnson, who founded a ministry called Standing Together, which seeks to advance spiritual unity and transformation in the state of Utah. Greg Johnson used to be a Mormon, and now he and his wife are professing evangelical Christians. 
As The Chosen gets ready to release season three, behind the scenes to promote the show, Daryl Eves and a gentleman named Brad Pello, who also is a Mormon, are doing interviews with Christians who are open to the ecumenical movement. Well, look over here. Uh, well, first, uh, Brad Pello, uh, we met first uh, recently, very recently on, on a, a phone call. And uh, so, Brad, welcome to the program. Good to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting us. We love what you are doing in building community among faith leaders and, and believers here in our state of Utah. Yeah. And Excellent. Brad is the executive, executive producer. Yeah. The executive producer uh -huh. for The Chosen. Yeah. Excellent. Now, are there multiple ex executive producers or one or how does that work? <laughs> it's, it's a title that gets used for many different purposes okay. in the entertainment world. Brad Pello joined The Chosen about a year and a half ago, but before that, he was a very successful entrepreneur and businessman. Some of his endeavors include he was president and publisher of Bookcraft, which is Deseret Book. He also was the chief distribution officer of Angel Studios. He was CEO and one of the founding members of Ancestry.com, where the Mormons do all their uh, genealogical research so they can baptize people for the dead. This next clip is Brad Pello speaking before the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, 11 years ago on behalf of media ownership and one of his companies, ITV. Um, <clears throat> by nature, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I dream about disrupting business models and uh, particularly old line businesses that uh, don't take early advantage of the opportunities before us. He's very well connected in the Mormon church and he's friends with some of the Mormon apostles. Well, and then Daryl, uh, nice to have you and to, to meet here. you today. Yeah. I'm grateful to be here. Um, watched a couple of your podcasts. It's a lot better with her than just you solo, just to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> a lot better. Okay, uh, good. No, but, um, you know, what I loved is, um, you know, I've, I've built a career around content and I love the authenticity and the vulnerability, you know, in a couple of your podcasts as of late. And uh, I'm like, man, I, I would love to be a guest and here, here I am. So Excellent. Why did Daryl Eves want to be a guest on this? this show. Well, just as an aside, Greg Johnson has dialogues with a Mormon named Robert Millett to promote unity and understanding between the evangelical and Mormon communities. Uh, I was raised in Louisiana. I, all my friends were Baptist or, or, or Methodist or Roman Catholic. I don't think it would have ever occurred to any of my friends that the Millets weren't Christian. I think they would have said, well, they're kind of different, but they're not, they're not, you know, they're not uh, there's no question they're Christian. Greg Johnson and Robert Millett have been having these interfaith dialogues for over 11 years. Uh, we kind of clicked too. We kind of had a mm -hmm. lot of fun as we mm -hmm. eventually would move on to a traveling, uh, com you know, companionship of, of going to different churches and speaking here and there. And the, we never really, uh, you know, it wasn't a marketed thing. We didn't try, you know, let's hit the circuit. Let's do all our you know well, marketing program. People called us. Yeah, we didn't we didn't advertise to the tune of. Exactly 65 public presentations over the course of about 11 years. United States, Canada, and Great Britain. Yeah. Robert Millett was a professor emeritus of ancient scripture at BYU. In other words, he was in charge of their religious department. He's written over 80 books. This book is called After All We Can Do, Grace Works. This book is I Saw a Pillar of Light sacred saving truths from joseph smith's first vision and this book is precept upon precept joseph smith and the restoration of doctrine i hope you realize greg that you're not going to convert dr millet i mean bob millet is the dean of our faculty he, he's not going to be converted and i said to him kind of to make him feel better hey i get that that's not my agenda that's not my plan well i don't get it what's the point if you're not trying to convert him, if he's not trying to convert you, why are you guys even talking? And it just came to me to say this. I said, you know, I think you're the point. People like you are the point because people like you have got to understand that there is a great value in knowing people that think differently than you do, understanding them, respecting them, showing them dignity and value, getting that in return, uh, learning how we can work together where we can, where we have to disagree, we have to disagree, and we're good about that. Notice how Robert Millett says in this next clip, 
that at the time he became dean, which was in 1983, he was given counsel by a church leader that he should start interfaith dialogues with Christians. I'd already been given some, uh, right at the time I became dean, given some counsel by a church leader that I needed to spend time building bridges. And I'd never thought of doing that formally before. If you think of Latter-day Saint evangelical relationships in the 90s and where they're at today uh, as a Latter-day Saint thinker, leader, and influencer, uh, do you think things are better between us as a result of our work and so many others also participating in this? I do. I think they're a lot better. What we dealt with when you and I would go out, we were talking with college students a lot. Yeah, yeah. We were talking a lot with young people, and, and I think I could say, and I think you'd agree with me, Young people ate this up. Yeah, and they Ad- continue to do ad- so. Adults were a little more suspicious or concerned, yeah, yeah. maybe. But young people, I think young people were tired of seeing people fight over religion. I yeah. think young people were tired of people uh, seeing misrepresentation yeah. or dismissing one another. In these next clips, Robert Millet was filmed training a group of young students at BYU how to lie for the Lord and evade many of the questions that Christians ask Mormon missionaries. Whenever a person asks me an antagonistic question, I never answer that question, but rather I answer the question they should have asked. That's why I I group this under, answer the right question. For example, if a person out of the blue that I don't know from Adam walks up to me and says, so you're a Latter-day Saint? Uh Uh-huh. Tell me, uh, you folks believe that man can become like God, huh? See, how do I respond? I mean, this is a total stranger. I don't know what he knows about the church. It may not be the smartest thing in the world to say, yeah, yeah, let me, let me quote the Lorenzo Snow couplet for you, and then I'm going to get the teachings of the prophet, and I'm going to read to you the King Follett Discourse. That may not be our best approach. It might be a much wiser approach to say, well, that's an interesting question. It is asked frequently. But, you know, let me, let me begin this way. In the spring of 1820, there was a young man named Joseph Smith, Jr., dot, 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 dot. What did I just do? I just answered the question he should have asked. How shall we begin our study of Mormonism? That would have been the right question, you see. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer the question they should have asked. The issue facing the religious world today is, was Joseph Smith called of God? And that's the single most important issue to determine. And they're going to find that out in only one way, by learning a little bit and praying a lot. Secondly, we really aren't obligated to answer everyone's questions. I've not had all of my questions answered. The Lord hasn't chosen to do that. He probably hasn't answered all of yours. And nor are we obligated to answer everyone else's questions. Point number three, and it relates to what we were just talking about. The principle, let's state the principle. We never provide meat when milk will do. We never provide meat when milk will do. Final principle. All of these are examples of what we call wisdom, using wisdom in response. Final principle is answer the questions from the right source. Brother Miller, can you give us a good scripture on such and such? I said, what do you need that for? Well, we're working with the Browns, and they are so great, but they want a scripture on. And what they always meant when they said that was, they wanted a Bible scripture on. What do you mean? It's not in the Bible? I said, no. He said, well, don't don't we believe in eternal marriage? I said, I think we do. (laughs) And he said, how can it not be in the Bible? You see what he's asking? I said, elders, it ever occurred to you that if everything we teach or believe were in the Bible, we wouldn't have needed a Joseph Smith, a Book of Mormon, a Doctrine and Covenants, or a Restoration. He says, well, these people, they want a scripture. I said, okay. You should sit down with them 
and read the 132nd section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verses 15, 16, and 17. And he looked at me and he said, like as if I had brain damage, he looked at me and said, uh, they're not going to go for this Doctrine and Covenants stuff. I said, Elder, that's modern revelation. If they're not prepared to receive modern revelation, they're certainly not golden, as you describe them. I yeah. think young people were tired of people uh, seeing dismissing misrepresentation yeah. or dismissing one another. Why has the Mormon Church changed its tactics from the early days where, with Joseph Smith's first vision, he openly attacked the Christian Church by saying all the churches are wrong, all their creeds, that means their doctrines, are an abomination, and all their ministers are corrupt. The gloves were off, and this is Mormon scripture in the Pearl of Great Price. Why, in 1983, did higher up, someone higher up in the church, tell Robert Millet that he needs to start building bridges with Christians. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, friends, we're pleased to welcome you to this evening of friendship. This event has been thought about, planned for, prayed over, and orchestrated for well over two years. It's co-sponsored by Standing Together and the Richard L. Evans Chair of Religious Understanding. Do you believe in Jesus Christ and the gospel of salvation which He revealed? So do I. Christians should cease wrangling and contending with each other and cultivate the principles of union and friendship in their midst. This is a wonderful evening for the Latter-day Saint community, for the evangelical community, a time to come together listen to inspirational music, and listen to inspirational teaching in a, in a place that is historic and significant to so many. How in the world was this arranged? How was it that Ravi Zacharias was uh, encouraged and invited to speak at the Tabernacle? President Hinckley, so many have asked why you felt uh, positive about this event and why you agreed to it, and he said, well, it sounded like a good idea. And so whatever our differences may be, it is wonderful that in a world torn by strife and so on, that we can come together, especially on a subject so vast that at the end of it, we are bound to walk away and say we know almost nothing of this because we are dealing with the loftiest of all personages, our very own Lord Jesus Christ, whom we follow and before whom one day every knee shall bow. Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. For we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. In the early days of the Christian church, in the book of Acts, it says a persecution broke out from Jerusalem with the first martyr, Stephen, and that the disciples, the early church, was scattered abroad preaching the word. Acts chapter 8 verse 1 and Acts 11 verse 19. This persecution continued for almost 300 years until Constantine, the Roman emperor, with his Edict of Milan, decriminalized Christian worship in 313 AD. And Christianity became the state church of the Roman Empire in 380 AD. So Satan tried to use persecution to destroy the church, but when that didn't work and Christianity was spreading throughout the whole Roman Empire, then his tactics changed and he infiltrated the church. It's the old adage, if you can't beat them, join them. This is Gordon B. Hinckley, 15th prophet, seer, and revelator of the Mormon church. The Mormon church, of course, is a nickname, and nicknames have a way of becoming fixed. Because of the shortness of the word Mormon and the ease with which it is spoken and written, they will continue to call us the Mormons, the Mormon church, and so forth. They could do worse. <laughs> Ever since when I have seen the word Mormon used in the media to describe us in a newspaper, a magazine, or book, or whatever, there flashes into my mind his statement, which has become my motto. Mormon means more good. We may not be able to change the nickname, but we can make it shine with added luster. Some weeks ago, I released a statement regarding a course correction for the name of the church. 
I did this because the Lord impressed upon my mind the importance of the name he decreed for his church, even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Let me explain why we care so deeply about this issue. But first, let me state what this effort is not. It is not a name change. It is not rebranding. It is not a whim. And it is not inconsequential. Instead, it is a correction. The Mormon Church knows it has a PR nightmare associated with the baggage that goes with the name Mormon. Polygamy, racism, strange Mormon underwear, you have the South Park episodes, things like that. Mormon history coming out on the internet. Time to drop the name Mormon, rebrand yourself so that you can blend in as just another Christian denomination. How did it get from that night to Bit Angel, which is now Angel Studio? Yeah, I love that. Um, so there, there was a, um, a PR uh, person that is an interface. His name is Matthew Faraci. He's a okay. Messianic Jew. Okay. Uh, wh who's friends with Dallas, saw it. And he says, hey, do you mind if I show this to some brothers in Utah that are starting up this studio? He just knew him. For Yeah, he was yeah, doing the okay. PR work for Oh, okay. Got he, I felt that I was introduced to a brother. Uh, brother in Christ, um, but also a brother in this life, um, and we complement each other. Was there any initial conversation of like, wait, I'm evangelical, you're LDS, just at the very beginning? Yeah, um, I, I do believe that Dallas um, had a lot of people telling him that he would be crazy to uh, start a business with, with uh, someone that's LDS, and a dis, you know someone um, distributing it that is LDS, right? Um, but this is what I love about Dallas. He was able to see my heart, and he's been the biggest defender of me and my family Amen. and my faith background. And he's literally had to endure stuff that. No one should endure yeah. because of our relationship. And honestly, I'll always be eternally indebted to him because of how he's defended me and my beliefs. And um, and on the flip side, he will say other things, you know, of how we've helped him, you know, and it's just been very synergistic yeah, yeah. of a project. Yeah. So... Sounds like something God would do. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it was a year and a half ago, I was living in New York City with my family, and the COVID pandemic hit us. And my wife's not a fan of sitting in her apartment all day for months. And so we came out to Utah. So we were here, um, sequestered up in the mountains at a resort. When my wife came in and said, you know that show I showed you in New York City that we watched that you liked? called The Chosen. Well, the guy that's making it just made a post and he said they're looking for a place to make season two. She said, you know, what about the Goshen set that the LDS church owns? And um, I, I had some familiarity with that set and the people who managed it. And I reached out uh, actually through Jeff Harmon to get an introduction to Dallas. And he introduced us and I invited Dallas to come to Utah and uh, just really said, let's, let's just go drive out and look at this set. Daryl was with us that day, and we, we drove to Goshen, and we walked the set. And if you've, well, you've seen it in season two, so you know it's just spectacular. As we drove away that day and kind of shared in the car our feelings, we knew we kind of needed to work around the naysayers to get that yes. We were able to get a meeting with a couple of the apostles, um, and Dallas and I kind of made our case. Um, Dallas makes a case really well because <laughs> he's just completely surrendered. I remember him saying uh, to these two elders, he said, this is your set. God's entrusted it to you. I'm not going to tell you it's mine or that you should say yes to me. I'm simply going to say, if God intends me to use it, 
he'll let you know. And we'll just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. So he's completely surrendered in that yeah, moment. Yeah. And I think that uh, humility, frankly, where he wasn't just pitching them, uh, gave them permission maybe to trust a little bit more. Because if you if we all trust the same God, then let him work with us. Yeah, yeah. So uh, 72 hours later, we received word that we were going to be able to use the set. Um, and it, it, it truly was miraculous. Even other people at the church were calling Daryl and I saying, how did you do that? <laughs> you know, we can't even get our own church productions on that set. In the course of getting to know Daryl and Dallas and, and the Harmon brothers at Angel Studios, it just became clear that there are some things that I could do to help out. Wow. And so a few months later, I was invited to first join Angel Studios, where I acted as chief distribution officer for about a year, and then subsequently have moved over to The Chosen now, where I'm providing my gifts and my kind of experience in life to help move this forward. So Brad Pello. Brad Pello. Bodyguard therapist to, to Dallas. Yes, and I just mentioned Brad in the video that you saw. That's Brad brilliant. could retire. Brad could be done with all. He's done more uh, in his life than, than uh, any, any of us combined and uh, could retire, um, but has felt called to serve the chosen and uh, has become a mentor to me, um, a leader in our team. Uh, he has, uh, and as I mentioned to you in the video, that he kind of he listened to God's voice in uh, helping make things happen to get us the set and helping make things happen when it comes to distribution. So you don't, right now you don't have a title. Uh, you've had multiple titles over the last year and a half. Leadership, mentorship, servanthood, uh, you know, you, uh, the, the, the Christ, last two Christmas specials um, were, kind of a shared maybe brainchild in terms of the original concept but then you were the one who made it happen and uh, brad was someone who came along at a time when we were so busy doing other things we couldn't do some of these extra things that that, that we thought were valuable but we just couldn't pull them off and then brad made them happen so uh yeah so well, now one you. of the key leaders of the chosen and we'll continue to help grow our our uh, efforts and resources and make sure that everything gets done properly good job brad <laughs> thank you but i would hope speaking into your audience, yeah. that um, to the broader Christian community, you will see my heart and our heart about coming together. You know, Dallas had some opinions about how things would be done, but Daryl and I produced that. That represents our sort of offering of let's let's come together. Did you? Most people probably don't realize there are a couple Latter-day Saint artists in those performers, you know, and they're some of the most beloved. But guess what? To my Latter-day Saint friends who already know those artists, they're like, you know, who is this Brandon Lake character? <laughs> He's you know? so good, though. He is so good. <laughs> you know? So I love the fact that our communities are coming together with, uh -huh. with our celebration, our worship, and our faith. You know, we've spent a lot of years as evangelicals trying to strategize and figure out, like, how can we reach the world for Christ? You know, and we have these conversations about how to do that. And it seems like with The Chosen, God laid the groundwork with some authentic relationships and and just did it himself. It sounds like even Dallas didn't even know, you know, the impact that it would have and, and the fact that it's reaching all different faiths. I'm very passionate about Mormon evangelical dialogue or LDS evangelical dialogue and that I've been involved with Robert Millett of BYU and various general authorities of the LDS church. And we've brought people like Rabbi Zacharias and Nick Vujicic uh, to speak in the letter to St. Tabernacle on Temple Square over the years. And we've seen some incredible things happen. Um, that story that you just told is quintessential to what I think God's up to. It's, it's not about the debate it's not about the black and white right now. We are really seeing the power of relationship. And if you just get to know somebody, it doesn't mean that the doctrine is not important anymore or that somehow it's all about compromising. I'll trade the Trinity in for salvation by grace alone. If you'll, you know, it's not about that. It's about knowing somebody and seeking God in his fullness together. The fastest way to grow a bridge is get to the heart yeah because the heart will not deceive right and Bingo. you can have the heart with different faith backgrounds i do do believe that and it will be sorted out later it really and, will and like our job is to gather and that that the job of of jesus is to sort it out later because that's that's what he said it was yeah 
I mean, it was it was Jesus who said, if you'll lift up my name, I, I'll do the drawing. Exactly. I'll do the compelling. I'm really, really excited for this year, and I can't wait for you all to see a lot of the stuff that we have planned, especially really going after the unreached. That's where our hearts have always been. Yep. Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that bids him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. Second John verses 9 through 11. Uh, Daryl, uh, from the beginning, been a partner on this project, so he and I are joined at the hip. From now until Jesus comes. Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Numbers 25, verse 3. A uh, difference of theology didn't happen until after Jesus left. Like we, I think we all agree upon the stories of Jesus and his parables and where he's at. It's when it's left, that's where theology kicks in. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who will hear you. 1 Timothy 4, verse 16. And there's like theology on it. Yeah. Well, we avoided that.